Welcome to Raving Ryan. I'm your host, Ryan Anastasio. Today, I have a very special guest, the mayor of Danbury, Connecticut, Mark Bowen. Mr. Mayor, how are you? How are you, Ryan? Thank you for having me on today. It's great to have you here. Um, prior to being elected in 2001, you served as a member of the Connecticut General Assembly and as a history teacher in Danbury. Um, can you tell us a little about your career before you were mayor and how you got to become mayor? Well, you know, I had a number of different jobs. Uh, I have a Bachelor of Science degree from Central Connecticut State University, earned a Master of Sci Science degree from Western Connecticut State University. Um, I taught history, as you mentioned, for yeah. 14 years in our public schools, served in the military prior to that, uh, served as a state representative, and I also owned a small business uh, in Danbury and in Brookfield. Okay, yeah, I want to move into some issues in Danbury right now. Um, the city of Danbury has a very diverse population. Around 68% of the residents are white, 25% Hispanic, and 7% African American. Um, Mr. Mayor, how do you incorporate the, the diversity of the city when you're making important decisions? Well, one of the great things about being mayor of Danbury is that we are so diverse, yeah. and so uh, part of my job is to try to build coalitions and consensus around certain decisions we have to make. We're never going to make everybody happy. You know, yeah. uh, whatever decision I make, somebody on the right or somebody on the left isn't going to be happy. So I try to govern towards the 65% of the people that are basically in the middle. They may be center right, center left. Most all of them are fiscally conservative and to varying degrees have their own theories about the role of government. But in general, I try to govern to the people in the middle, uh, and I think that's served me very well over the last eight terms. Yeah, and uh, very recently a Danbury police officer was arrested after a video of him kicking a handcuffed suspect came out uh, last summer. Um, can you tell us a little more about the situation and how it's developing? Well, it's something we take very, very seriously. Um, yeah. Anytime there's a question about the use of force by one of our officers, uh, in this case, um, I would say that there's not necessarily, I wouldn't call them extenuating circumstances. I understand why it happened, but it doesn't yeah. make it right. Uh, in this case, um, one of our, uh, uh, probably one of the most popular office, officers in the police department was viciously assaulted by somebody with no uh, provocation at all. Yeah. Um, and it was really a very uh, difficult situation for the rest of our officers who went on scene. Uh, emotions ran very high, and unfortunately this one officer was, uh, uh, violated our use of force policy towards the suspect. Um, we didn't know at first, but we picked it up on the videotape. That's one of the good things yeah. about having so many cameras around. Uh, once we did, um, we forwarded it over to the state's attorney's office to see if they had uh, any thoughts about that. They issued a warrant last week, and um, that individual turned himself in, and uh, he'll have to, uh, you know, uh, be punished to the full extent of the law, and yeah. also uh, uh, obviously won't be working for the Danbury Police Department. Yeah, and um, just following the inauguration of Donald Trump, a student at Danbury High School was harassed by uh, somebody uh, holding a Trump sign saying to people that they were illegal in the get of the country. Uh, Mr. May, what do you make of the situation that happened? Well, we did. Um, first of all, it's appalling. Um, yeah. But there are a lot, again, there's, there's only a 15-second or 14-second, six-second uh, vignette of what yeah. you think happened, but there was stuff before there and after there. That happened. So um, we did submit for a warrant uh, for the judge. I'm not sure if he'll grant it for us for a breach of peace charge against that individual. Um, but uh, if you saw prior, we now have three videos where we used to only have one. And and prior to him saying that, um, he got into an argument with one of the students there who came up and was uh, offend, quote offended by his Trump sign. And that's what started yeah. the whole thing back and forth. Then it picks up the video that was seen pretty much out on Twitter. And at the conclusion of that video, then three of our students got into an altercation with him and ended up uh, physically assaulting him. So and they probably should have been arrested as well. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, uh, these things tend to uh, only be defined by the actual video yeah. that you see. Um, however, um, we still think uh, that a breach of peace charge would be merited in this particular case. Yeah, and I want to move into some uh, uh, questions about the current state of Connecticut. Um, currently, the state of Connecticut is in a lot of debt. Uh, state officials have talked about adding tax, new taxes and possibly traffic tolls to get out of this deficit. I mean, about, and how do you advise the governor and other state officials to get out of this deficit? Well, it's interesting that you ask that question. As the past president of Connecticut Conference of Municipalities, we put together a path forward uh, yeah. for our municipalities, our cities and towns, and for the state. The number one, I think, takeaway from that report is that we're trying to decouple cities and towns from the state of Connecticut. So we know that the state has its problems. It's got to work its way through uh, crushing financial debt. Uh, at the same time, we don't want to be dragged under with them. Uh, and that means that we, if you, if you take away our state aid, 
but leave us alone and give us other avenues to collect revenues. We'll, we'll be just fine and we'll be able to deliver the services that our residents expect. Um, we'll see how the legislature takes that report and whether yeah. the governor uh, takes it seriously. Um, but there are certainly a, a number of different methods and ideas that are pointed out in this report that we think would be really good. Yeah, what do you think of adding traffic tolls maybe to get out of the deficit? Yeah. See, here's a problem with, with, with stuff like tolls. Um, if you give the state any more taxing authority for a new source of revenue, yeah. what we know and what they've demonstrated to us over the last 50 years is they'll spend that on anything but what they're supposed to be spending yeah. on. So you give them more toll money, they're going to go out, and they're not going to spend it on our debt. They're not going to spend it on roads and bridges. Yeah. They're going to spend it on new programming um, because they just can't help themselves. So there has to be uh, a little bit of um, culture change in the way they do business in Hartford before you can give them the authority to go and collect tolls. So from a philosophical standpoint, it's a bad idea. There's also a practical standpoint for us here in Western Connecticut. About 50% of the people that come into Connecticut either work here or shop here from New York State. Yeah. And that, it's a huge economic um, uh, relationship that we have with Putnam County, Dutchess County, and, and Westchester County. We don't want to lose that because people now will be penalized for coming into the state. And they'll choose to go elsewhere and spend yeah. their dollars elsewhere, and that could hurt us economically. So you may actually lose more than you gain in collecting the toll. Yeah, but what do you say to people that say that we go to other states and we pay for their tolls, so why shouldn't they pay for ours? Well, I, I would say that we pay the highest gas tax in the nation, and that's uh, because the, the gas tax that is collected at our gas pumps is supposed to go to pay for repaving of roads, rebuilding of bridges. The problem is the legislature took that money, spent it on other things. So if you allow people to toll, you're really charging people twice for the same work. So you filled up your car, you've already paid in the form of the highest yeah. gas tax in the nation to fix the road, and now we're going to collect the toll to fix the road. So you're paying yeah. twice. So this is really a problem where state government has to get its spending under control has to understand uh, the impact of these decisions and has to change the way that they do business. Yeah, and the in the current the current pension plan for state employees is contri also contributing to this large deficit. Well, there have been some bills in the state legislature to try maybe eliminate pensions for some people or possibly state legislators. Um, do you think by maybe uh, revising the pension plan can help uh, get out of this deficit? Well, there's that's one thing that has to be done. There's a number of different strategies that have to be yeah. uh, followed to be able to get the state out of deficit. Uh, but what we call uh, post-employment benefits uh, are absolutely an issue, whether it be retiree medical, whether it be pensions and, and the amount of money that has to go in to pay for those each time. And there are certainly, um, I wouldn't call them abuses, but I would say that there are plan design changes that have to happen. For example, at the state level, you take your highest three years of work and you're allowed to count overtime and every other form of payment in that. And so that inflates uh, the pensions and what the liability is for our taxpayers. In Danbury, you're only paid on your true salary. You can't count overtime, you can't count your uniform allowance, you can't count all the other things that you get as an employee here. You only count your base salary. So that's one strategy that's been proposed. It's a good strategy, but that requires a negotiation between the unions. They're not going to want to do that. Yeah. Um, they're going to say tax the rich and just charge more taxes. So it'll be interesting to see how that works out. But th you have to do something with those costs or um, we're frankly going to continue in this death spiral. Yeah, I want to move into some questions about the 2016 election that happened. Um, in the election for president, you said that you wrote in your dog's name for president. Um, why did you do this, and what, do you, why did you, what did you not like about the other two candidates? Well, I didn't really write in my dog's name. That was sort of tongue-in-cheek. Oh, okay. It was a joke on Twitter. I voted for Trump, Pence, um, and uh, uh, I definitely could not have voted for Hillary. And uh, I was just having a good time, and people just ran yeah, with yeah. it and went uh, the other way. But that was a joke. Okay, and so uh, what, what, do you, what do you think about Donald, how, what Donald Trump's been doing the past few weeks with the, his uh, travel ban and some other decisions he's made? Well, I think he's doing exactly what he said he would do. I mean, one thing that is refreshing about Trump, with all of his idiosyncrasies, and there are many, um, he's one of the few politicians I've seen that, that from day one does exactly what they said they would do on the campaign trail. Now, those policies have sometimes profound impact yeah. and unintended consequences. But the fact is, is that you can't say that he lied to everybody when he ran for office because this is what he said he would do. Yeah, and um, how do you think that how, da how Danbury can work with maybe the Trump administration to get some city grants? Yeah, I mean, we're, you know, we'll work hard at those. We're always chasing grant dollars, yeah. both in the Obama administration, before that the Bush administration, and now the Trump administration. So we're going to keep fighting to get our fair share of federal revenue and um, uh, we've worked well on, on specific grant programs like CDBG, Community Development Block Grant money, and other areas, and we're going to keep working with them.
And you recently attended the United States Conference of Mayors in Washington, D.C. Uh, can you tell us about what, what, what went on in the conference and what you got out of it? Yeah, those conferences um, are actually really helpful for a couple of reasons. One, um, you have a meeting of literally hundreds of mayors from, yeah. and all the big cities are there, Los Angeles, San Francisco, New York City, they're all there. Uh, and it's an opportunity for us to share what's worked in their community, what worked in my community. So it's a great place to get ideas uh, about any host of issues you can think of. In addition, the United States Conference of Mayors also puts on seminars yeah. on specific pieces of governing that I always find very interesting, whether it's municipal finance, whether it's community policing, uh, whether it's um, um, how to remove graffiti. There's always uh, really good uh, programming there that you go to. And, and essentially, it's like getting a refresher course. So you get to meet with other mayors and compare ideas, and you also can uh, increase your base knowledge of how to be a mayor and yeah. uh, take some of those ideas back with you uh, to the city of Danbury. Yeah, I want to move into some more national issues. Um, there are currently many sanctuary cities across the U.S. and, and some in the state. Danbury is not a sanctuary city. Um, recently, President Trump said, he, said that he would cut federal funding to sanctuary cities. Uh, Mr. May, what do you think of uh, sanctuary cities as, and do you think that they should cut federal funding to them? Well, you know, sanctuary c cities city is a thing. nebulous term. There's no real definition out there what yeah. that means. And so different communities and different cities call it something else. But some of the ones that I've seen that have been um, the most far-reaching uh, a really bad public policy. You can't have a local municipality saying that we're not going to cooperate with the federal government, particularly when they're involved in investigative cases, criminal activity, things like that. Yeah. It's really, really bad. Um, it sounds nice, it's a feel-good thing, but uh, it's almost um, uh, nullification in reverse. Basically, a, a city saying, well, we're not going to listen to the federal government. Yeah. The Obama administration wouldn't put up with that and the uh, uh, Trump administration shouldn't put up with that. If you want to change immigration laws, there's a really simple process to do that. Get representatives and senators elected, yeah. propose your, rep your legislation, and get it through the Congress, um, and then you can pretty much do whatever you want. Danbury uh, works closely with our federal partners. They're a, what we call a force multiplier for us and us for them, meaning that there's more eyes on the street. Uh, we will uh, hold somebody on an ICE detainer, an immigration detainer, if they're wanted by uh, the federal government until they can come down and pick them up. Uh, we're going to continue that practice. We haven't changed that through any of the administrations. Yeah, I want to move on to a, a question about crime. Um, Danbury is fortunate to be a city where crime is not an enormous issue. However, there are many cities across Connecticut and the whole country that uh, that crime is a huge issue in in the city. Um, Mr. Mayo, how do you th work with law enforcement to to keep the crime down? Well, there's two things that work with that. One, we have made a substantial investment, new police station. We've uh, civilianized our dispatch. We have more police officers and cars on the road than we ever had before in the past, and that's all nice. But the number one way to keep crime down is to have economic opportunity for your residents. It's no accident that Danbury, while having the lowest crime rate, also has the lowest unemployment rate. Yeah. So the more opportunity people have to find a, a good paying job that they can raise a family on, the less uh, opportunity they'll take uh, to get involved in criminal activity or with a criminal element in the community. We've been really successful on doing that. We focus every day here on helping our businesses stay in business, expand here in Danbury, or we recruit new businesses to Danbury. Yeah. Um, in fact, recently Danbury was rated as the best city in, in Connecticut to start a business in. Um, and so we're happy with that kind of designation, and we want to keep working on that. Yeah, and it was just um, Aetna, the corporation in Hartford, is being rumored to being leave the state. What do you think of this? Well, you know, I think it's tragic. I mean, yeah. the fact that as we sit here, uh, Governor Baker in Massachusetts is having high-level yeah. discuss discussions with the CEO of Aetna um, is not good for us. And what's really frustrating is, in the past, if you lost a business to South Carolina or North Carolina, or even California, if you want to go way back, uh, you kind of understood it, yeah. right? Uh, what we're seeing here now is places like New York State and Massachusetts are eating our lunch. And they're doing it because they've got a lower base tax rate. They're doing it because they're more business friendly. They're doing it because they can move permits quickly through their process. And they're doing it because they've made the smart investments on their infrastructure. Yeah. And these are the things that we have to do here uh, in Connecticut that just haven't happened. Yeah, and how do you think we can make it more business friendly? Well, yeah, there's, there's some big things you can do and there's some small things you can do. Obviously, no business wants to pay more in taxes, yeah. and that's a discussion. But there are 27 taxes and fees out there. Many of them are applied to business that it costs more to collect the tax or fee than, than you get in return. 
So eliminating those right off the bat, I think would send a nice message to uh, our businesses in Connecticut. The other thing that doesn't cost any money is to move the permit process quickly. We've got a great uh, little grocery store that wants to open here in Danbury on a state road. They've been waiting over a year for their permit, yeah. over a year to get a curb cut permit. It's no wonder people pick up their money and go somewhere else and invest their money somewhere else. And we have to recognize that and we've got to speed that process. Yeah, and in 2018, there's going to be an election for governor in the state of Connecticut. Um, there are some people that have announced that they are running. Um, you, I don't, you haven't officially announced yet, though. Um, you've ran uh, two, oh, twice before on a successfully. Uh, Mr. Mayor, why do you want to be governor and what do you think you can do to help the residents of Connecticut? Well, in 10 I ran for lieutenant governor yeah. and uh, with Tom Foley, and we lost by about 4,000 votes. Yeah. 2014, it just didn't work out for us. Uh, after We did very well at the convention, but after uh, uh, we weren't able to finish off the fundraising piece of it, and it just didn't make sense for us to go forward. So at this point, in 018, uh, for the 018 cycle, uh, we have an exploratory committee for statewide office. It's yeah. not geared towards any one office, um, but uh, we are engaged in the citizens' election program trying to collect uh, hundred dollar checks that would qualify us yeah. um, and if the, that support is there then we'll make a decision about running for for uh, specifically governor or any other office um, if I were to run for governor um, look I think I have the right skill set and the right story to tell yeah. about what we've done here in Danbury and I think I can share those skills on the state level um, I tend to govern from a position of bringing people together and coming up with consensus common sense solutions uh, and not necessarily governing as an ideologue uh, from any particular political perspective. I, I'm a person that just wants to get from point A to point B as fast as possible yeah. and uh, get as much done in government as we can, keep government as limited in your life as I possibly can, and try to keep your tax bill down as low as possible. Uh, and if we follow that recipe, uh, I think uh, we can really lead the Connecticut comeback. Yeah, and what do you think you're going to do differently this time so you can um, for perhaps win this time? Well, one of the things we're doing is we're starting a lot earlier, right? Yeah. So we just, we file a committee uh, really in 016, um, uh, late, late in 016 around Thanksgiving. Um, and we use that time to build up an infrastructure and now we're off to the races out there trying to raise a dollar. So that gives us a full year. Yeah. In the past, uh, in 014, we started in August um, and I was in the middle of a municipal election cycle as well. So it was hard to concentrate on two elections at yeah. once. Um, and uh, you know, once you hit December, uh, the fundraising pretty much dries up because of the holidays. And so you're not going to do anything until January. Well, that time, it's, you're into the middle of the actual cycle itself. Yeah. And, you know, it's, uh, it's 2014, and, um, uh, it, you know, it just got, got away from us. So starting earlier, building up a broader uh, support system uh, in Connecticut. We have over 50 town captains already uh, from Sterling, Connecticut, and Stonington, all the way out here to Danbury um, that are on Team Bountain. They're out there working for yeah. us. Uh, and uh, we continue to add new people every day. And would you ever consider running for U.S. Congress, maybe in 2018 for the U.S. Senate or the United States House of Representatives? You know, I think uh, House of Representatives never really appealed to me. Um, it's a two-year term. Um, you could spend a lifetime in there, and, it, you know, if you're not in the majority party, you don't get anything done. And uh, even if you are in the majority party, you don't get anything done. Um, I would rather... The, rather be mayor than be in Congress. I mean, every day I come to this organization, and when I wake up, uh, young children are going to programs that we designed. Uh, people are using uh, services that we have provided, um, and uh, we're hopefully changing lives for the better. Um, that's a really good feeling. That's what I get out of this job. I don't know yeah. if that's the case in, in the Congress. U.S. Senator is a great job, uh, but I probably would need about $15 million. So unless you want to write me a check, I don't know if that's going to happen anytime soon. Uh, I'm just a thousandaire. I'm not a millionaire. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. I want to finish up with some personal question. Sure. Um, can you tell us a little, uh, some of your hobbies that you have? Uh, I'm a big golfer. I love to play golf, and uh, I've been playing since I was about 12. Um, uh, my career in the golf course has starting to arc downward because I don't play as much as I used to, and uh, I've gotten a little bit older. Um, so I really uh, enjoy doing that. I love uh, watching movies and. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, to, uh, always fancy myself a little bit as a director and a commentator and a reviewer on, on movies. Yeah. Um, and I love to miss it, listen to music. I love to hike. Uh, and I've done a lot of hiking throughout Connecticut, and I continue to work on that. I've got a trip planned next year for New Hampshire where I'm going to hike up uh, Mount Washington. So, yeah. um, you know, uh, those are kind of the things that I like to do right now. And, and I actually like to cook, too. Yeah. I'm a pretty good cook.
And you're you're a very active user on Twitter. You have lots yeah. of followers. Um, can you tell us how you use that to enhance your uh, career as mayor? Sure. I mean, great thing about Twitter uh, and Instagram and Snapchat yeah. and Facebook. It's exhausting, and you know when you, when you think about it, um, is that it's a, just a different way that you can communicate yeah. to people. Uh, and you can uh, put your own message out there. It used to be people ran and got the paper, and they would say, "Okay, that's 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 what he must have said." Where now you have a medium where you can talk first person directly with no filter from me to you to say, "No, no, no, that's not what we're trying to do." Or here's the problem, or here's the solution. Um, and but you got to be good at all of them, right? Facebook has a certain demographic. Yeah. Twitter has a certain demographic. Snapchat has another demographic. Uh, Instagram has another one. So you got to kind of be a jack of all trades in that space. But um, it's a great way to reach out to residents, give them important information, get them involved. Uh, we've actually registered people to vote through, uh, through our, our Twitter feed and other things and yeah. um, let people feel connected to the local government. Yeah, and I want to finish off with a question that we ask everybody that we interview. Um, do you have a favorite pizza restaurant in the state of Connecticut? You know, there, I do. I, I like, uh, obviously, uh, Pepe's yeah. uh, here in Danbury. Um, they're very good. Um, there's one in Derby, Roseland, oh, that yeah. I like very, very well. Um, and I like Apollo Pizza as well, which is right on Route 34. But listen, if you put a piece of pizza in front of me, no matter where it comes from, I'm going to bite your hand off. So <laughs> I like pizza, and I'm pretty good at eating it. Yeah, and Mayor Bowen, I'd like to thank you for coming on. Um, you know, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can go to ravingryan.com. You know, follow me on Facebook and Twitter, and obviously follow Mayor Bowen on Facebook, Twitter, and Snapchat. Um, thank you for watching. Reporting for Raving Ryan, I'm Ryan Anastasio.